So, <clears throat> here we are <laughs> with me losing my voice. I So here we are at the uh, fourth and final lesson in this, uh, in this month's lessons. The fifth video, actually, if you include the introduction, but the fourth in this series of uh, reclaiming your ability to learn um, as a young child, uh, as opposed to what? As opposed to your being trained by every school to memorize and recall information and that they all call that learning. It makes, it makes being in school very difficult. And it makes those moments where you have emergencies, discoveries, it makes them rarer. They happen, usually because the teacher is really reliving their own discovery and they introduce that in the middle of a class and uh, something is connected to the lesson, but something from their life. Which brings us to the theme of this fourth lesson, which is the idea of connection as the goal of learning. So now we've talked about at other times um, the idea that, um, well, the two sentences from um, the early chapter, an early chapter in my book on science, um, probably two sentences that I love um, in the top ten sentences I've ever written. Um, that's saying a lot. So, it starts, the goal of a scientific method is to discover how natural things connect. It is the patterns in these connections that give things meaning. This is a profound idea. First of all, it talks about connections in natural things and discovering the connections. They don't just come to you and you can't just be taught them. Um, but it, that second sentence, it is the patterns in these connections that give things meaning. So, connection as the goal of learning. So, can you see how that science overlaps with what I am beginning to see as a science of learning? And that learning is a subset, because in learning, Single points, which is what you memorize and recall for most of school, single points, a point itself is not connected to anything. So often, as presented in the classroom, unless you have something connected to it, a personal experience, the point you're memorizing has no meaning. So immediately, I go to a rediscovery. You see the smile? I'm thinking of the summer before I was in social work school, and me being me, I'm reading the first assigned textbook for the first one of the classes, and it is a historical view of social work. And whatever reason, something sticks, because I think I imagined the story um, as I read it. and. Uh, the title, which is the words that were assigned to this story, right, is The Sturdy Beggar Law. Somewhere early 1600s in England, they made a law. If you were capable of work and you were found begging, um, now I don't have the story, but something pretty serious, like... Um, you were being, you were killed. Okay. Now, I don't know, and I don't care that I don't remember the specifics. 
I, I don't feel that pressure. I, it has changed me. That idea that that law completely contradicts the idea that a person who can work has a starving family and, and yet they should be punished because they can't find work even when there is none. Okay. So that's straying away from all of this. But when I read, when that just came to mind, the, I, re, I re discovered it on the fly. I, it was as if I was reading the book as I was talking to you and picturing what I might have been picturing then. And the feelings and the experience of it, uh, they were recreated on the fly, but recreated, rediscovered. That's why the surprise. So, what we're going to do this time, and you don't need to pause the video for this, but I'm going to ask you to think about things. I'm going to give you two different uh, situations, and I'm going to do a single point version, and I'm going to do a connected version, and the single point version, single point, is formally an emergence called the first geometry. And the second piece, the connected one, looks like two single points which are connected with a line. It looks like a barbell. And this is called the third geometry. I don't care that you remember those. Please don't try and write it down. Don't memorize it. Nothing. Just look at the, the drawings. One is a round gold circle and the other one is two round gold circles with a bar connecting them. Just think about those two differences as I now ask you to picture um, the single point version of the first case. So I'm going to need to read it a little bit. So um, picture a time when you were angry and it only made things worse. Do your best to picture something. Now visual first, conceptual second. What is the concept of, of, uh, that, that, com you know, that comes from that? All anger is bad. You should try to avoid getting angry. Probably no one listening to this is, does not have some sort of a time and experience wherein that was said to them. Probably more than once. Some people say very empty things like, why get angry? There's, it's not going to change anything. Yeah, okay. And yet every revolution that's ever changed the world <laughs> were led by angry people. <laughs> sometimes bad, sometimes good, but anger. So picture a time when you were angry and it, made, it only made things worse. And the concept is all anger is bad. You should try to avoid getting angry. Single point. What is the third geometry variation of this? Always a pair of opposites connected by this thread of similarity, the bar. So the thread of similarity here, the bar, is anger, feeling angry. And this one says, picture a time when you were angry and it made things worse, and also a time when you couldn't get angry and you got abused. That's pretty deep. There were many times when I think if I had gotten angry, a bully would have left me alone. But because I was afraid, I froze and I was bullied. I can say through my whole childhood, my mother was a very angry person and would do things that someone from the outside looking in would make them angry, they would be angry. I don't know that they would do anything. I would hope they would not hurt my mother. But, you know, they would get angry and somebody might have spoken up for me at some of those times. But I couldn't get angry and so on. So the concept, anger can be both good and bad. You don't avoid it, you manage it. What does that mean? Well, it means sometimes you need to get angry, and sometimes you need to not get angry. And you need to think about that anger is neither good nor bad. It has to fit the situation, 
and you don't make yourself have the feelings. Really what we're talking about here is that in both these cases, acting on the angry feelings, taking an action. In the first one, picture a time you were angry and it only made things worse. Okay, so you showed anger and it made things worse. That's what it's saying. And the concept, all anger is bad. And then in the second one, picture a time when you were angry and it made things worse. And also a time when you couldn't get angry and in effect that made things worse. So the concept is anger can be both good and bad. Don't avoid it. Manage it. Have it as a choice. This is the third geometry. Now this is a lot of words, but I want you to look at the idea that consider those golden balls and in the first one, the single point, is some kind of a voice saying, all anger is bad. And in the second version, you have one of the balls and the sound, the voice inside says, anger is bad. And in the other one, it says, anger is good. And for you to understand what anger is in a human being and angry actions and so on, can you see how you need both to understand, to give it meaning? How many times have you seen a movie where there was an underdog and somebody was being mistreated and you just wished that they would get angry and rise up and protect themselves? What happens if you use the single point concept? All anger is bad. So look at how much truth you can discover by moving from a single point. I didn't say that the first, the single point isn't true. What I did was I contrasted and compared it to its opposite. And I used visual um, material from my past, from things I've experienced, and I tested it. But visual first. In the first one it says, picture. In both cases, picture. Visual material first. And in both cases, second concept that can be drawn from those pictures. Okay. Example number two. The single point side. Meeting your own needs first is selfish and wrong. You should always meet the needs of others first. Picture a time when you were meeting the needs of another person first. Okay. Concept. Tis better to give than receive. Truly a gagger in my opinion. <laughs> but it's not me saying, tis better to receive than to give, because that's also a single point, and that's a gagger, especially for a two. It's not possible. <laughs> Okay, so what's the second one? Meeting your own needs first is sometimes selfish and wrong, but so is always meeting the needs of others first. Picture times. The concept. Tis better to give and receive. You know, on that note, I love that statement, but on that note, what I'm doing now, someone could see it as giving. It is. But I am reliving discoveries or making discoveries as I talk. I never rehearse. I don't have a script, no teleprompter. That's why there's so many mistakes and awkwardnesses, which I don't mind at all. The homemade cake. That's me. But giving, yes. I'm giving my experiences, I'm sharing. And receiving, yes. I'm actually receiving from hearing my own words and reliving these experiences and rediscovery. After I do one of these, I feel energized. The bigger thing is to see the two that are one here. Because the two is giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. And the one? 
they really don't exist separately. We only talk about it that way. When you're truly giving, you're truly getting, and vice versa. The two that are one. In any event, this is the last of the four talks about reclaiming your love of learning as it was when you were one and two and three years old. This one is kind of highfalutin and lots of words and it isn't as visual at all as the first three. But you see, I took those four um, lessons and tried to make them increase in complexity from the first to the last. This one is in some ways the most difficult because those words that I wrote, read and the pictures, they have to get shoved into either a single point or a third geometry, a barbell. There's never a time when I sit and talk when that barbell isn't a part of what's happening for me. The two that are one are words. The barbell is a picture. The barbell is in my mind. It just comes like the cumulus cloud or the candle flame or the fish in a fish tank or an asparagus. They just come. I have never memorized any of those things. And I have never memorized anything in emergence. That sounds pretty strange, even as I say it. And yet, I have never memorized anything in emergence. What emerges in me is the visual part of it, the picture, the way things connect, the colors, the shapes, the lines. Often, I simply try to do what I did with the baby, the four character type babies, which I construct the drawing from what I feel the thing to be, and then I talk about it after the drawing is made. This is my standard way of discovering for myself to draw some kind of a drawing, and then to look at the drawing, and to notice where there are opposites are missing, and what's not symmetrical, and so on. It is so, it's so easy once you learn to start with the visual part. Anyway, I know this has been a lot. It hasn't, and maybe it hasn't, because there's none of this that you are getting, having to write about. There's that. There's also the idea that I imagine that you could probably go back and look at these, this sequence of uh, talks a year from now, or, or one week from now, and every time you look at it, experience some moments of rediscovery. What does that mean? It means that if you have actually been following even a small amount of what I'm saying, that every time you look at it, it will be like a two-year-old. Every time they're shown a story in a picture book, maybe of a puppy's journey around a yard or something wonderful to a child, they want that book read to them over and over and over again. And every time it's new, because the child learning, early childhood learning, is consists entirely of discovery. Discovering what? Discovering the connections between natural things. Why? Because the patterns in those connections are what give everything, every single thing in our lives and in our minds, meaning. Hopefully this will help you in your journey to learn to change lives. And as always, remember, one of those lives is yours. Please remember, give and receive. And that, done well, they become something that, though it transcends those words, it becomes the one, it becomes the one way to love learning. And if you notice me welling up yet again, <laughs> by now you must be getting used to it. As always, I'm glad you're with me on this journey, and I wish you well. <laughs>